Thank you, Sasha. Thanks to the organisers. Uh, it's a pleasure to be giving the first talk at the first delivery conf. Um, here we all are. Uh, thanks for coming. So, <clears throat> it was considered madness when the first when the book came out. People thought we were crazy, and I think in many ways we were talking about this last night as we were going through our slides. Our last ten years has basically been showing that this stuff works at all levels in all domains. Dave's been doing stuff with continuous delivery with FPGAs. I've been doing stuff with continuous delivery in the US federal government. Uh, Dave's been doing it in financial exchanges. This stuff works everywhere. Uh, there are no limits to it. You can't anymore say that won't work here. And it's important also to note that we didn't invent this. We drew on projects that we were working on at the time uh, when we were both working for ThoughtWorks in the UK. Um, uh, working on big, complex projects, doing this stuff. That's where the stuff in the book came from. And it also has origins going back to the Extreme Programming book, uh, Mary and Tom Popman Dick's Lean Software Development book, um, Dave Namecheck's Steve McConnell's Rapid Development book, uh, and also concepts that have been around for, for decades. Um, David Parnas's work, Dave was talking about last night. Um, Unix. I, I read this thing... Uh, that was written in 1978 by a bunch of people talking about uh, Unix. And if you read this, you can see a lot of themes that we can recognize today in the way that we build software. Make each program do one thing well. To do a new job, build a fresh, rather than complicate old programs by adding new features. Expect the output of every program to become the input to another, as yet unknown program. Don't clutter output with extraneous in information. Avoid stringently columnar or binary input formats. Don't insist on interactive input. So you've got the seeds of microservices right there, and certainly a decomposed modular architecture. Uh, and then the continuous delivery bit. Design and build software, even operating systems, to be tried early, ideally within weeks. Don't hesitate to throw away the clumsy parts and rebuild them. And then four, use tools in preference to unskilled help to lighten the programming task, even if you have to detour to build the tools and expect to throw some of them out after you've finished using them. So there's some of the C's, for example, of the SRE approach to operations. Um, so these concepts have been around for a long time. And I think what we did is we took our practical experiences um, from implementing some of these uh, and from our colleagues who had implemented them and, and put them in a book. Thank you. So the other way of describing practical experience is uh, doing things wrong lots of times. Uh, and we, we, did, we did our fair share of that. Um, I, I remember when we, just one kind of sidebar, when, when, when Jez and I were starting out uh, with the book, and we were, we were getting somewhere, and we were both quite proud with the draft that we got at the time, and we were talking about what success would mean for the book, and I remember that Jez saying that he hoped that you weren't enough to buy a shed. <laughs> I, I think it had a bigger impact than that. Um, I, did, I one, did get my shed. <laughs> yeah, he did get his shed, so that's cool. Uh, I, 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 I think one of the things that, that I want to talk about uh, is, that, is, is that I think that continuous delivery is an important and broader concept than we often give it credit for. The, the book was really focused on this stuff. The, 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 really, the spine of the book was the deployment pipeline. There are lots of other things in it than that, but it described this. And there have been lots of takes on this uh, over time. I, 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 can, I consult for a living, so I often see clients, and, and they'll often have a, a staging deployment pipeline and a, a development deployment pipeline and a production deployment. That's not what we meant. You know, what we meant was that you have a, a, a mechanism that you stuff changes in one end and releasable, production releasable software comes out the other end and you do whatever it takes to achieve that. And, and when you start retaking that, continuous delivery develops a broader context. Sorry, uh, pressed ahead. I think it's important that, that, that you know, there are many focuses and many different kinds of behaviours that are essential to be able to achieve that kind of flow, to be able to establish this this flow of ideas and this validation of ideas. And you must be, you know, you must be taking automated testing seriously and doing, uh, to my mind, test-driven development is a fundamental part of this. Continuous integration is a part of this. Uh, BDD, acceptance testing, is a part of this. Performance testing, if you're interested in that. Uh, um, compliance, all of those things are all part of this. This leaks out, and, and that's one of the things that I want to talk about a little bit in my sections as we go forwards. 
And I think the import, <coughs> you know, another important thing about this is it's not so much, people focus a lot on the tools and the workflow. Yep. And it's, the important bit is that you're doing all the things <laughs> that are in this workflow. Like, it doesn't matter if it's not all tied together using a beautiful workflow tool. What yep. matters is that you're taking all the changes and doing all these activities to them. Um, you're doing performance testing, you're doing component testing, you're doing acceptance testing. Um, and I think one of the biggest things for me that's changed in the last 10 years, and people are going to expect us to talk about things like Docker and Kubernetes, and, and we're not, because those are really great tools. But I think what's changed is the process and the activities, and that's one of the most important things, I think. Um, one, one thing I just add to that is that fundamentally, and, and I, I want to talk about some of the fun fundamentals this morning, fundamentally what this is really about is feedback. It's about optimizing for really great quality feedback. And that's what the deployment pipeline is for. And however you achieve that, whether that's through technical mechanisms or efficient people processes or but whatever else, it's really about trying to make sure that we can get really high quality feedback quickly enough to really have an impact on our development activities. Yeah, so if you take one thing away from this morning, that should be it, uh, well, from our talk at least. Uh, in terms of what's changed, uh, I like this diagram from Cindy Sridharan because it talks a lot about the kind of things that have emerged in terms of operating systems. So we talked about infrastructure as code um, and uh, configuration management for production in the book. Um, but all these things like distributed tracing, profiling, chaos engineering, um, uh, traffic shifting, these are all things that have emerged in the last 10 years that are, are really important. Um, the operating of distributed systems in a secure way, uh, in a reliable way, and being able to keep changing them. This is all stuff that has emerged, but it all fits under the same theme of like testing and feedback, basically, and being able to see what's going on and get fast feedback so that you can change. And that doesn't invalidate the testing that you have to do before production. You know, people are like, testing in production, that means I don't have to do testing before production. And everyone was like, no, no, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> we want to be really clear that that doesn't invalidate all the stuff that you have to do as part of the deployment pipeline before you release as well. I did have one friend who worked in a, in a very small startup with almost no, no, no <coughs> users, and he did say the thing that he found terrifying was that continuous delivery even worked when you were, when you were only testing in production. <laughs> but, but no, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, so I, one way of kind of thinking about what the next 10 years will look like is to kind of think back on the, on, the, on the last 10 years. And one of the questions that I get asked a lot, and I'm sure that Jez does, is, is whether we have any regrets about the thing, you know, things that we did put or didn't put in the book. And to be honest, not many. I think, uh, uh, I think Jez would share my opinion that we were both surprised and delighted at the success of the book and the impact that it's had on the industry. It, it was beyond our wildest dreams, and that's a lovely feeling. To, to have ha had an influence like that. Um, but I, I, and I think there are some important reasons for that, which I do I don't want to get to. But, but fundamentally, I think one of the, well, you know, some of the ideas that we could have communicated better with the, with the benefit of hindsight and with the proviso that our book is already over 400 pages long and if we'd added all this stuff in, it would have been 800 pages long. Uh, but, but continuous delivery is not really just about automated testing or an automated deployment. It's about the continuous delivery of ideas. It's about how do we optimize a process to have an idea and get that in the form of working software into the hands of users and figure out what the users make of it as quickly and as efficiently as possible. How do we do that? And if you start thinking of that in those terms, it's more obvious what it is that we're talking about. It tends to leak out in terms of the scope, and it tends to affect other ways of thinking about broader issues uh, that I want to talk a little bit about as we go through the day. Um, we should have talked more about engineering. To my mind, uh, I think that continuous delivery is, uh, is actually a genuine candidate for a true, proper, strictly defined engineering discipline for software development. And I want to talk a little bit more about that as we go through as well. We should have talked about more about culture. We talk, should have talked about the, the behaviors that are re required to be able to deliver this kind of thing and the impact that that has on the ability to do the technical stuff of delivering software well and, uh, and efficiently. And my own personal regret is that we should have talked more about bloody security. At the time when we were writing the book, at the time when it was published, I was writing one of the world's highest performance financial exchanges. We tested every aspect of security that we could think about. And it never occurred to me to write anything about security testing. And then we come along with horrible portmanteau names like DevSecOps and stuff like that, which drives me nuts. <laughs> because because I, I thought it was kind of plain that what we were talking about is that if you want to do continuous delivery, what we're talking about is you test everything. 
and that's what we were kind of aiming for. So this is the kind of thought that I want to explore in a little bit more detail. Continuous delivery is about the continuous delivery of ideas, not just software. It, and that's important because it has a broader reach and a more, more profound impact on the organizations that practice it. Um, as I said, the, the, the core of the book is really about this stuff. It's about build automation, test automation, infrastructure as code, deployment automation, and, and, and the, the unifying idea around those things of deployment pipelines. And the book is kind of consciously structured around those sorts of things. But in order to achieve those, in order to make that a useful concept at all, you need concepts like DevOps, and, and you, need, you need that to be involved with the business and to, to take security into consideration as well. Uh, but you also need to take into consideration the relationship between dev and, and product and dev and QA and product and QA and product and ops and all of those things too. This is about collaboration and efficiency organizationally to achieve good outcomes. And if you want to do that, if you want to make those things work, you've got to think in terms of the requirements process, team structures, product design, regulatory compliance, software product selection, software architecture, all of these things have an impact. And there's more. There's more than that. <laughs> it touches on governance, the way in which projects are financed, organized. Uh, it, it, it touches on incentive programs for the st staff, and so it has a relationship to HR programs. It's about monitoring and operability. It's about A-B testing, product life cycles, release, stra release strategies. Um, uh, lean management techniques, iterative planning, evidence-based decision making evolutionary architectures. All of these things, to my mind, and I for, I forgive me if I'm trampling on any sacred cows. It's, it's, I, I am a heretic by nature. But all of these things, I believe, are what are required to genuinely achieve continuous delivery in the sense of the continuous delivery of valuable ideas into the hands of users. If you look at the organizations that are world class at doing this kind of thing, they don't look like traditional organizations. And there are good reasons for that. And one of the things that uh, I personally have been working on for the last uh, six years is actually helping to add some scientific rigor and research to this. Um, Nicole is at the back here. Please stand up, Nicole. This is Dr. Nicole Forsgren. Um, so Dr. Nicole Forsgren is the principal investigator of the State of DevOps uh, research program, which we've been doing for the last six years. We've gathered huge amounts of data from all kinds of organizations of all sizes worldwide. And we've actually validated a lot of the things that Dave just talked about, which is the importance of, uh, this is the BFD, or Big and Friendly Diagram, um, <laughs> which you can go to uh, bit.ly slash Dora dash BFD and, and get this. You won't be able to, I can barely read this from here, um, which I think talks to the fact that, you know, we've done a lot of work over the last, we've been busy. Um, but fundamentally what you can see, uh, and I'm just gonna trace out the key structures here, uh, at the back of this diagram is leadership. Uh, effective transformational leadership drives the implementation of a bunch of practices or developing a bunch of capabilities, uh, lean product development capabilities, working in small batches, uh, the ability of teams to experiment with ideas, uh, a lightweight change approval process, some lean management stuff like limiting working process and visual management, all the technical practices that we talk about in the book everything from uh, effective data management and database change management uh, to you know, loosely coupled architecture, CI, uh, deployment automation, and so forth. Those capabilities drive software delivery performance, the ability to deliver with speed and stability. They also drive a high-performing culture, a safe culture, a culture of psychological safety. Um, and that culture also drives software delivery performance. And uh, that ability to deliver fast drives organizational performance. So we've actually been able to validate using science a lot of the things that we talked about in the book and that Dave has just talked about right now. And it just emphasizes the extent to which it is actually hard and complex to uh, implement this. Thank you. So, so, so I, I, I think in thinking about what the next 10 years is about, one of my hopes is that we start to to lift our perspective out of the trenches a little bit, to start thinking more broadly about what this stuff means. And absolutely, continuous delivery is driven by really great technical performance. To be able to do this, you need to be good. You need to, be able to, you need to have a great story on automated testing, software architecture, 
uh, uh, deployment, configuration management, all of those things. You need to be good at those things for, to, to really function in, in, in this space. But you also need to have great organizational performance. You need the way in which the, the, the teams are structured, the way in which they collaborate or don't on things, the degree of autonomy in those teams. All of those things are essential for success on doing this at any kind of scale. And to do all of that, you also need great cultural performance. You need to focus on certain kinds of behaviors uh, you need you know, diverse thinking in the, in, in the teams that operate on this stuff. You need technical rigor and, and to my mind, a scientific, really rational mindset uh, and approach to solving these kinds of problems. So my ambition for the next 10 years is that we do more of this stuff. We, we, we concentrate more on, on some of these things. And these things are deeply interrelated. You can't kind of succeed at one of these things without, without the others. Interestingly, the stuff that uh, Nicole and Jez uh, and their team have done has kind of shown the way in that you can help lead the change through some of the technical practices, but the technical practices are not alone aren't enough. <clears throat> um, so just to kind of position this and the importance of this, uh, here's, a, here's a, a quote from a... Uh, a, a respected mag magazine, and this is, the, this is the interesting bit. At this point, the greatest impediment is not the need for better methodologies, we know what those are, empirical evidence, we have that, uh, uh, of significant benefits in terms of software development, or proof that Agile can work outside of IT, we know that too. It's the behaviour of executives that are the limiting case. It's the way in which management operates in the organizations in which we operate is often the problem. Those who learn to lead Agile's extension into a broader range of business activities will accelerate profitable growth. This is for that, from that well-known uh, extremist publication, the Harvard um, uh, Business Review. Um, <laughs> So, so this stuff is important. This stuff is some of the stuff that helps us to change the world. I, I think one way of thinking about this, one of the big problems that I perceive, you know, lots of people kind of get the sort of technical aspects of continuous delivery. Lots of people have got continuous integration in place. I'm a bit of a, uh, a, a pedant when it comes to terminology. Um, I, I, I think that the, the, the terminology that we use, the words that we use for things, helps us to think certain kinds of ideas. Forgive me, uh, I, I think that DevOps is a, it takes us a little bit down the wrong track. It focuses too narrowly on the problem. I think continuous delivery gives us a broader picture. Um, but um, but the, you know, the, there are other kinds of you know, terminologies that, that, about getting some of these things right. So I like to kind of go back to kind of you know, fundamental principles. And if we're really interested, you know, if we think just really broadly about what it is that we're trying to do, this is kind of the nature of the problem. This is stolen from um, Stephen um, Bungay's uh, work, but, uh, but it's, it's a lovely little um, uh, uh, model. So we're trying to achieve an outcome of some kind. And in order to achieve, do that, we need to make a plan of some kind, and then we need to carry out some actions to, to achieve that outcome. The problem is, is that there are these gaps. There's the knowledge gap. There's the difference between what we'd like to know versus what we really know. And then there's the gap between uh, the alignment gap, what we'd like people to do and what they really do. And then there's another gap, which is the, the, the expected outcomes versus the actual outcomes. And all of these gaps add up. And we've tried for years to try and address these gaps. And we've tried different ways. The classical responses to each of these gaps are kind of interesting when you think about them. The knowledge gap, the difference between what, we, what we'd like to know versus what we know. The traditional response is, let's plan harder. <coughs> let's analyze more. That's definitely solved the problem. Let's get more detailed requirements. But these are complex adaptive systems. They don't work like that. You can't solve those problems using those techniques. We've been trying to do that to my personal experience for nearly 40 years, and it doesn't work. So that's not it. The alignment gap, what, the difference between what we like people to do from what they really do. We, tend, we could do micromanagement. That's one approach that we could try. We could use process control. Let's nail this down and make sure that everybody does the, exactly the right thing at the right time. We could increase bureaucracy, and that will definitely work, right? Again, it's a complex adaptive system. It doesn't work like that. Those things don't, don't solve the problem. And then there's the effects gap, the expected outcome versus the actual outcome. The classical responses to this are expectation management. We try to make sure that people don't get overexcited about what it is that they're doing. Where we use watermelon status reporting. If you haven't come across that term before, it means it's green on the outside and red in the middle. <laughs> 
and we increase p uh, project management rigor. Again, not the outcome that we need. The problem is, is that th there's something fundamental here. You can't close the gaps. Those gaps are always there. So how can we work more efficiently and more effectively? And for me, this is something that nearly all of the organizations that I'm consulting tend to miss. Um, the only way in which you can really fix this problem is that you can work to reduce the gaps. Not close them, not eliminate them. So here's the, the original gap. There's the new gap. By speeding up the whole process, we reduce the gap. We make it smaller. So we, want, we must make progress in smaller steps. The technical term is reduce the batch size. We must reduce the batch size of our thinking and our changes so that we can more accurately evaluate each step as we undertake it and change course if that's necessary. And because we're working in complex adaptive systems, you can never predict what's going to happen. That's the whole nature of software. You learn by doing. There's another, there's another angle on this, is that I've, I'm writing another book at the moment which is about software engineering, and I've been kind of thinking about this more broadly. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is that the kind of the evolution of the software revolution. And I think there's, a, there's kind of been a, a significant change uh, uh, that's happened. And it was kind of characterized for me by a mutual friend, an ex-colleague of ours, Gregor Hope, talking about this at an event that I was at in, uh, in Australia uh, last year. And he kind of characterized this in terms, of, in terms of the way in which software is perceived within an organization. And I've just kind of pulled out a, a more readable version of the table that was behind him in that picture. What does your business think of IT? And a good way of thinking about it is where does your CIO report to? If your CIO reports to the CFO, which is common in most traditional organizations, then the sensible strategy for them is cost-cutting. That's what they want to do. That's how you, that's how you make change. You, you, it's about cost-cutting because it's seen as a cost, uh, you know, a, an expense, software development. And so you're going to be thinking about outsourcing IT and those sorts of things. Um, if, you are, um, if you're at the other end of the spectrum and your CIO reports to the CEO, that's a completely different worldview. The strategy then is about economies of speed. I think this kind of represents two different extremes from a step change in the evolution of our industry. Much of our history, the early part of the kind of the software revolution was really about taking existing processes in organizations and automating them. And to be honest, because everybody understood those processes, you could kind of get away with to totally inappropriate, inefficient processes like waterfall to solve those kinds of problems. Um, now it's changed. Now, software in much of the world, throughout much of the world is really about revolutionizing organizations and culture and business. It's about inventing new kinds of marketplaces, new kinds of products. And to do that sort of stuff, that's a much more creative thing. And uh, in, in this picture here, look, I see the common strategy line. IT is the business for much of the time. And so this stuff re really starts to matter in terms of the impact that it has on organizations. The economies of speed matter. And so the effectiveness and efficiency of the feedback loops that we can create and maintain organizationally and technically are vital to the success of, of business. And again, the State of DevOps report work highlights this as an outcome. So the, these kind of two on the left are sort of represent traditional structures, the two on the right are sort of digital disruption. I would argue that software development is really about two things, if you're a real, real reductionist like me. Uh, fundamentally, software development is about exploration and learning on the one hand, and it's about managing complexity on the other hand. And so we should optimize to be able to be really effective at learning and really, really great at managing complexity. The way that this plays into continuous delivery is that continuous delivery is about working in a way so that we get regular, frequent feedback on the quality of our, our ideas. That's the most effective way of learning. If, in fact, I talk about it these days as it's kind of grounded in the scientific method. We are exploring and discovering and learning what we're, what we're doing. Managing complexity is about compartmentalization and dividing problems up into smaller pieces so that we can kind of un, you know, make progress. That's about architectural approaches, but also continuous delivery drives that because testability is also mon, multi, um, amplified by... Uh, by, uh, by uh, modularity and those sorts of ideas, which again give us levers into managing complexity. So well, there's, there's kind of a virtuous circle here. 
So how do you optimize for those things? For learning, you need to iterate, you need to employ feedback, you need to work incrementally, you need to be experimental and empirical in your approach. Continuous delivery gives you this kind of, this bedrock that allows you this platform on which you can kind of work that way. Managing complexity is about modularity, separation of concerns, information hiding, cohesion, loose coupling. And that's about design. And again, testability drives that, that uh, testability and deployability, hallmarks of con effective continuous delivery, uh, drive those kinds of architectural properties into the systems that we create as well. So, th so what we're talking about here is really about engineering. Uh, and, and I mean that in the strict sense. I don't mean that as, an, 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 uh, as being like engineers. I mean, what is engineering really? Engineering is about applying scientific, rational thinking to solving practical pro problems with e within economic constraints. If you start to think of it in those sorts of terms, then you know, engineering is the difference between us and essentially kind of cave dwellers and, you know, or maybe even agrarian economies and the explosion of, from the Enlightenment that happened started two or three hundred years ago. That's the difference between our high-tech civilization and what went for hundreds of thousands of years before it. Engineering allows us to start tackling really, really hard problems. And so, en so engineering is important and we, we do a disservice if we discount it in software. But this isn't just about uh, software. What I'm talking about, it's, it's about engineering products and organizations and cultures and applying that kind of thinking, applying those sorts of techniques to evolving better outcomes, better organizations, and having a bigger impact on, on the markets in which we operate. Fundamentally, well, I am enormously proud, proud of Continuous Delivery, the book, and the work that Jez and I did. Uh, and I think that, uh, I think that we were both kind of lucky because I don't think, that, you know, while we were writing it, we thought about the impact that it has. With hindsight, and if you'll forgive the hubris, I think that it was important. I think it was important because I think it represents a step change in thinking about the way in which we think about software. And, and if we start applying that kind of thinking, we can have a really deep impact on the culture and the kind of organizations in which we operate. Fundamentally, I genuinely, I, I'm, I'm a pop scientist. I'm, I, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm my, one of my hobbies is reading about physics. Uh, I have a physics degree. Yeah, he's a proper scientist. I'm a pretend scientist. Um, fundamentally, I think that what we're talking about here is genuinely the application of scientific style reasoning and how can we apply that and get traction from that in software development. And this is the scientific method. This, to my mind, this is the thing that revolutionized human history. Before this, we used to guess at stuff, you know, about what went wrong. After this, we would carry out experiments and we would learn. And so we, we make a guess based on experience and observation. We propose an explanation. We make a prediction based on, that, on our proposal. And then we test the prediction and we repeat. That's how you solve problems in a complex adaptive system. That's how you work in those kinds of environments. And crucially, just to return to the theme of feedback, you've got to be able to do this quickly because most of your ideas, if you're innovating, will be bad ideas. One of the things that we talk about in Accelerate um, that uh, Nicole and I wrote uh, with Jean is the difference between delivery and product design. Um, and the idea that actually we've got two domains that we're operating in. Product delivery, um, the stuff that we talk about in the continuous delivery book, is, is about fast, predictable flow from check-in to production and building a really fast engine that gives you high quality, fast feedback on what you're doing in a way that's predictable and low variability. What you put into that engine are the ideas, and those are very uncertain. Some of those ideas are going to be very valuable, some of them are not going to be very valuable, and that's the domain of high variability. And this is why you know, people often ask us why we don't measure lead time in state of DevOps from idea to production, and that's because you're fundamentally crossing two domains. One domain is the domain of ideas, uh, which is highly variable, and the other domain is the domain of delivery, which is, should not be, should be low variability and high predictability. What we're trying to do is make it so that when you've got ideas, you can get really fast feedback on whether you did the thing right and whether it was the right thing to do. And really, you want that lead time to be as short as possible because that's what enables innovation, and, and that's really what it's about. 
So just a couple of thoughts on the next 10 years of continuous delivery for, from, from me. Um, I think you know, the stuff that Dave is talking about is, is, is super important. Just on the micro level, though, I really wish that people, you know, in the next 10 years, people actually do CI in, in the way that CI is actually defined. Um, <laughs> so who here is doing CI? Put, put up your hands if you're doing continuous integration. Put, put down your hands unless all the developers are checking into a shared trunk or master or mainline at least once a day. You're not working on feature branches unless those feature branches are merged into a shared trunk or master at least once a day. If that's not true, put your hands down, otherwise you can keep them up. When the build breaks, is it typically fixed within 10 minutes? If that's not true, put your hands down, <laughs> otherwise keep them up. All right, so that's, that's not bad. There's like probably over 10 people in this room being <laughs> this So well done to all of you. Um, so yeah, I would like to, us to actually implement continuous integration rather than be running CI tools against our feature branches and then ignoring the building that breaks. Um, and TDD, who's actually writing tests before they write code that makes the test pass? Fabulous. There's got to be like 15 people in this room doing that. <laughs> That's brilliant. So, you know, th these are my personal, you know, hopes for the next 10 years is that, is that we see that, as well as the larger scale changes that enable the true culture of engineering. Uh, we did some research into what works uh, in terms of adopting these practices that's in the 2019 State of DevOps report. And the TLDR is that high performers favor strategies that create community structures at both low and high levels in the organization making them more sustainable and resilient to reorgs and product changes. And you can see that what high performers are doing is things like building communities of practice um, and grassroots movements. Um, that, that's how you adopt this stuff, is by enabling teams to experiment with ideas and pursue the scientific method at the team level uh, and enabling that at the organizational level. Um, and I just want to end with something that I think Dave and I think is very important. We talked about the continuous delivery of ideas. Whose ideas? Who gets to have their ideas delivered? And who are the customers of those ideas? Uh, and to what extent are we actually respecting our customers and our users? If you look at the program conference, if you look at the speaker list, you should notice a couple of things. Firstly is that we've got really brilliant speakers who are at the top of their fields, um, experts who I'm very excited to learn from over the next two days. The other thing you should notice is that it's a much more diverse uh, lineup than the tech community in general, and that it's much more representative of the wider population. That's really important for a few reasons. Not just because uh, you know, it's actually a justice issue that people should have access to higher paid jobs, um, but also because we don't, you know, the tech industry is going to change the world whose ideas get delivered. We need to have diverse teams so that we actually represent the people who we serve. Um, and actually also there's research showing that diverse teams, by which I mean protected characteristics like race and, and gender, uh, sexuality, uh, disability, those teams actually perform better as well. But crucially, we're the people with, who are going to actually come up with those ideas that get delivered. So... That's, for me, one of the biggest challenges and one of the most important challenges of the next 10 years. Uh, thank you so much to the conference organizers for doing a really great job producing uh, a very diverse uh, roster of speakers, as well as a really excellent uh, roster of speakers. That, that's great. Um, thanks to all the speakers for coming and sharing your knowledge. Thanks, all of you, for coming and listening to us. And uh, yeah, thanks for putting in the extra effort to do that. Thank you. So first question, anybody, is there any challenges you're facing? So, you know, they talked about it being, you know, holistic uh, changes, that kind of stuff. Anybody want to say, hey, here's something I'm facing in my organization? So. Oh, can't touch it. All right. So this isn't happening necessarily in my organization, but it happens with the companies that we work with. I work for a company called Armory, and we help uh, 
bring enterprise spinnaker to the world. And one of the quotes that came out of the uh, presentation, I think Dave presented this, which is, the greatest impediment is not the need for better methodologies, empirical evidence, or significant benefits, or proof that Agile can work. It is the behavior of executives. And so the question, or the discussion point I'd love to know is, how ha what are maybe some of the strategies to change the behavior of executives? What has uh, anybody here seen work to change the behavior of an executive? And I know that's a really daunting problem to put on everybody, but that's what I'm curious about. Can anybody help address that? And if you're in the audience and there's one you want it, you can always jump up. Uh, I see Cora running up. <laughs> you can't take the mic. I can't take the mic. Okay, <laughs> put my hands behind my back. So I know where I work, um, we have to do a lot of cost analysis, and if we can get it, get an ROI that's there, that we can put a number to somewhere, even if it's on people, because it's hard to get people. It's really hard to get people with certain technical background skills. Um, we can make it. We make a case for it, and that's what when I when we talk up to the executive level, we have to say like, we have to put the logic and the reasoning and the numbers and the uh, effect of, of on our customers down there. And once we do that and we put it up in a business case, we get business. We get like, oh yes, this has business value. Yes, you may have this. You may have this pot of money coming down. I, I think even, even when you don't term in, in, in strict kind of dollar business value terms, I think it's important to change the, the, the tone of the conversation. You're not going to win the hearts and minds of, of, of people, senior people in an organization by talking about technical strategies or you know, deployment pipelines or DevOps or those sorts of things. Those are not the things that, that win. We need to talk about business impacts, and we need to talk about the ability for businesses to, to, to evolve, and, and that's really kind of part of the stuff that was behind the talk, my talk today. One second, Sasha. I'm going to pick on a good friend of mine. I don't know if you heard the question. How do we change the mindset of execs to do this? Uh, John Esser is a CEO. How do we get CEOs to say, we need to drive business value and, and make these changes? Okay. Wow. This is a big, big... <laughs> um, I think, you know, I like the... Uh, the ROI, I, I like that approach, um, but frankly, um, I think it's more comprehensive than that. Uh, my experience uh, with uh, executives and also being executive is really, um, overall, you've got to generate uh, an emotional response to actually change your business, right? And I don't, I know this is a big topic, it's quite a complex thing, but many times I've seen the ROI thing, while that can be valuable, it just doesn't go quite far enough to actually change, uh, you know, the culture in the organizational way, right? There's that old saying, strategy eats culture for lunch, and that I've seen the continue, or sorry, culture eats strategy for lunch, sorry. Um, yeah, there's a lot of eating going on, but, uh, uh, but at the end of the day, um, you really have to generate an emotional change within the organization to really propel it into a new direction. And I know that's a big, ambiguous thing. If I could be a bad facilitator and add one thing, there's a book called Driving Change by Dr. Linda Rising and somebody else who I'm forgetting, I apologize, but I highly recommend it for that area. I was going to say that the one of the things that I think really helps people see both that ROI and the emotional impact is the, the scientific method where you're like, I wonder if this would work. How do I test whether people who are humans who are on the other side of the screen will feel the same way? Because I've seen people so many times make great new features and great new changes that serve their needs. And the people who make software are a tiny, tiny percentage of the people who use software. And it's so easy for us to forget that. Thank you. Continuous delivery is obviously from the Agile Manifesto. I think it's right there in the preamble. Agile itself, uh, closing in on its 20th anniversary, is both popular, now ubiquitous, and over-marketed and over-hyped to the point of cynicism. What is your, are you, the experts and in, uh, attendees in general, concerned about continuous delivery falling a similar fate when I hear you say with all those little circles and yet more circles and yet more circles to the point of them being illegible, uh, the critic or the concerned technologist in me 
wonders if this is just expanding this to what is admittedly a second order complex human system, which does not yield to the scientific method. Has the scientific method been applied to human history successfully? Okay, you so I give, wonder just if that is worthwhile. For time box perspective, you want to give a quick answer to that, and then we'll move on to the next question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so so, I, so I, I think it's the only thing that works. So, so what I'm talking about is, is continuous delivery, not in the sense of a reliable, predictable release mechanism. That's, a, that's kind of table stakes to allow you to do other things. But it's the thinking. It's the thinking about how can I optimize my organization to rely, you know, regularly release changes in, and evaluate them and learn from them. And I think that is, so can we test that against history? I think that's what the Enlightenment was. I think that the, you know, the generation of a high-tech culture bloomed from the skeptical mind, not assuming that, we're all, that people, anybody's always right, but rather assuming that everybody's always wrong and working on that basis and then working to try and figure out how we learn from that. And I think that's fundamentally what underpins all of those different activities and why it has an impact on them all. If you want, you know, if you, if you, if you want to be able to build a, a remarkably innovative product, you know, you want to be able to test the water and find out what's good about it and what's not good about it without betting the company on it. So how do you do those kinds of things? And that, that's the kind of thing that really drives, you know, this radical change, okay. I think. So I'm going to cut him off there, but I'm going to encourage folks. That we have the, 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 this is why we set up breakout rooms on the other side of the sponsor table and the lunch room. So absolutely, can grab, continue that conversation. So first, any, now next one. Uh, success if you had this everybody. Anybody, anybody did something pretty cool they're proud of, they want to tell people about? I know, I know somebody has. Something you didn't think you could do. You know, uh, my culture wasn't going to do it, but I did test it, and it worked. Yeah. Maybe it's a small success. Uh, in my organization, um, engineers were doing things in very weird ways. So we were working on uh, Microsoft platforms. So the, most of the DevOps that we had is that somebody wrote a huge script that delivered bits once you build them somewhere on a share. And it was all of the DevOps. Um, I was trying to invest much into things like, oh, okay, like even test deployment is complicated. Why don't you write like some command and it does it? And it's like nobody was really supporting. So the way to successfully do that was basically volunteering personal time and actually get it done and then present them. And then like 10% like are, oh, it's cool. And the rest, ah, I don't care. And then only like two years later now, these are the tools that are used and there is no other way to do things. So. I don't know what's the learning from here. I wish organization was more invested into that rather than having people volunteer into that. But that's the story of little success. Cool. Thank you. Nice. Um, I actually have a related story. And I think I'm going to turn things around a little bit. And I think the power of example is really useful in terms of bringing more people on board. So um, on two large software systems, um, I've seen decomposition and letting you know, an individual team say, I'm going to deliver my own stuff and I'm going to work out a contract with the teams that I'm associated with so that I deliver software on my own schedule. And then that team cranks down what they need to deliver stuff faster and faster. And they get down to weekly pushes. And everyone else says, I want that. I don't like delivering every two months and then spending six weeks cherry picking while release candidates fall by the wayside because we've got to get a new cherry pick into our environment. Lead by example. Yeah, I, I actually had a question, but you know, seeing uh, CEOs getting beat up, I just wanted to point out one thing. You know, my CEO actually, I'm the CEO of a small startup, and my CEO actually forced me to you know do continuous delivery. Um, so there are CEOs like that, you know, who are you know acting the right way. So just want to point that out. And he's standing right there, by the way. Oh, sorry. Uh, so really, from my point of view, being a CEO taking over a software company, it's about predictability of delivery. From the executive view, they have to go to their investors or to their board, and they have to put together what the plan is for the next period, whether it's a quarter, half a year, or a year. And if you're off on that, my gosh, it looks bad. They have to have confidence that when they say we need to deliver these things by this date, that they're going to be delivered, at least within reason. So the continuous delivery is hugely important. You have to get to the why. Why are we building this? Why are we doing this? I think it was Jez said earlier, 
You have to start with idea to delivery and everything in between. How do we actually really do that and make it happen? Business value to delivering in the hands as fast as we possibly can with quality. So I think that's right. I, well, I don't like the pre predictable thing about <laughs> because it's about experimenting and trying stuff out. But 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 yeah, I think in principle, in terms of the in terms of the, the things that um, that we've done that that surprised me, I've done some work in regu I've done quite a lot of work in regulated industries, including in healthcare industries, building machines that can kill people, and we've applied continuous delivery in those environments, doing something that. Some of my clients have started calling continuous compliance. That was kind of kind of cool when we when we when we got when we got that stuff working. Yeah, I was on a meeting this morning where they're doing continuous delivery to cars. Um, okay. Sorry, one more very cool one that I read about recently. Uh, they people using uh, Kubernetes and Docker in jet fighters to to deliver software. Oh, I don't I don't like that. <laughs> Kelly, we'll give you 20, 20 seconds. I got to move to the next me next question. Just wanted to make a quick comment. We talked about the value of, of examples. You know, we all look to the various kind of unicorns that are out there, and for most of our lifetimes in tech, who we've looked to, towards as a big example of how to build large systems and culturally has been Google. You know, we looked at a lot of their systems, the SRE model, and so on and so forth. One of the things that I'd point out is that uh, their culture and their engineering practices and their style of continuous delivery. So uh, the marketing so Kelly, names I'm sorry, are we're, very good. I'm going to cut you on time. But you, Amazon Kelly, Builders can, Library is the thing cool. to look at. Amazon Builders Library. Okay, so we only have like three or four minutes for the last one, but I want to make sure different people came for different things and different reasons, so I want to make sure everybody gets there. So from an industry perspective, so we have cloud vendors here, we have CI vendors here, have, you know, there's people that are going to listen to recordings later. What do you need that you don't have? What do you, you know, from a tool perspective, culture perspective, a book that you need to, you know, how to change things, uh, you know, you, I can't give you a new CEO. Um, who has, who, what do you need? Very quick, I think I need some standardized set of interview questions so that we can hire the right people. <laughs> so I think a lot of it is a culture part on here of culture within the company and the, within the in individual contributors and going all the way up to the executive level. So I think we need more like tooling and ways to influence that so that we get the culture that pr allows us to really thrive on the tech. More DevOps days. <laughs> I, uh, I really, you know, I, I think everybody here has experienced this uh, very uh, difficult uh, hiring issue. Um, Right, very tight labor market, the skills. Um, I would really suggest that we focus on reskilling, training, right? Those that are in the company. Um, I, I think, anyway, I think that goes a long way. So I would make that strong suggestion. Make an investment there. Building on what Cora said, uh, culture is important. And since we have uh, CEOs as a captive audience, not sure how often that happens. Uh, do hold us accountable on the financial outcomes. As engineers, I welcome that. But when we prove to you the financial outcomes of better CD practices, do accept that <laughs> and take it for what it's worth, rather than saying, well, that's not how we have done things before. Yep. Uh, just to call out for something to do is that let's get computer science graduates taught the scientific method. <laughs> yes. Was there somebody over here? Did I see a hand? So as an individual contributor looking for opportunities to practice continuous delivery in the larger sense, what should I be looking for if I don't already have somebody I know inside one of these places? I'm not sure I understand the question. What, what should you be looking I got, for? I got friends who have hired me into great positions. I don't happen to know anybody right now who, you know, is in a, a company that's using continuous delivery in the larger so from on the topic, what I hear is that you want something to do build more, something more networking, which hiring problem is a thing. Maybe if there was some place that was a better network where we could solve both ends of this problem. OK? It's just, yeah. So from software development performance perspective, I want to understand what is the mantra to quantify uh, 
organization culture improvements. That's one of the challenges we run into. There are different metrics, time to delivery, lead time for changes, whatnot, but Dora really lives and breathes by you know, changing the culture. How do you measure that? So I, I, we're kind of coming up on time, but the, this is one of the questions for the panel tomorrow, and I think you know they're going to be there's going to be a very good discussion about that. Okay. Stability and throughput. Read the Dora stuff. Stability and throughput. 